Moi aussi, j'aimerais remercier les organisateurs de me donner cette opportunité là, dans un auditoire extraordinaire. Je ne présenterai ni en français ni en québécois, mais je vais faire comme Hugo Bellin, je vais retourner en anglais. Alors, what I would like to do in the next maybe half an hour is to maybe first quickly make the point that you don't need to hear about is how good Drosophila genetics are, and then move to uh, maybe from genes to proteins and show you a bit what we could maybe do in the future by working with proteins instead of working with genes. So it's quite obvious, we have heard that, and Hugo Bell is probably one of the best examples of this, that you can do a lot of things. You can screen yourself to death with Drosophila. It's extremely powerful. There's hardly any other system you can do that. Uh, easy to keep large progeny is, of course, in, is important when you do genetic screens. Um, but this extensive genetic toolbox, to which, again, Hugo Bellin uh, contributed, contributed enormously, is important, and, of course, a large scientific community. So with all of this, uh, I think Trotsovila made its way. As you all know, there are several Nobel Prizes that have been given uh, for work on flies, starting off with work that was clearly uh, genetically driven, uh, from Hunt, oh, this is very high. Uh, from Hunt Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan, to Muller, E.B. Lewis, Christian Nusslein, and, and Eric Wieschaus. Uh, these were genetically based uh, uh, studies. These studies then were later on, of course, complemented with uh, a lot of other studies, biochemical studies, like the work of Schull uh, and, and Beutler, of course, and more recently, Jeff Hall, Rosbach, and, and Young. They started off with using Drosophila genetics and then com complemented well, with all kinds of other methods that had developed uh, in the meantime. Now we also have CRISPR-Cas, as you also all know. Now we can edit the Drosophila genome in all kinds of different ways. Uh, so we can, for over 100 years, I think we can manipulate genes to alter the encoded proteins rather successfully. And it is difficult to imagine that there or any limitations left to modify the genome of Drosophila. Of course, you can introduce completely new chromosomes. There are ways that are not easy to, to manage right now, but the existing genome can be modified in many ways. So when I was a, a postdoc, when I joined the lab of Walter Gehring uh, as a postdoc, my aim was to work on morphogenesis. By the way, in Walter Gehring's lab, I met Hugo Bellen, who taught me, who knew nothing about genetics, and that's no joke. He taught me everything that he knew about genetics, and that was a lot 30 years ago already. <clears throat> so morphogenesis had always fascinated me, and the question is kind of, you see all these different shapes, you see all these different animal forms and sizes, but of course this is also true for internal organs. So how do organs form? How do tissues or entire organisms acquire their appropriate shape. Uh, this is still kind of a very interesting question. It's genetically determined to a very large extent. The genome is large. There are lots of mutations that might affect it. The answers are not as clear as we would probably like uh, to have them. In flies, very often, if you work on morphogenesis, you choose a certain organ. Uh, we chose, for example, the trachea. How does the trachea form? Eric Wieschaus, uh, for example, chose how does the mesoderm uh, invaginate during gastrulation. Very kind of simple questions that at the end of the day turn out to be rather difficult because it's cells that communicate and do a lot of things within a short uh, time frame. So it's kind of trying to do in vivo cell biology. These are the questions that we kind of tried to answer when we started off 30 years ago or 25 years ago to work on the tracheal system is how do individual cells behave in these developing animals? What do they actually do? How do they contribute to organ formation? What do they have to do? They divide, they migrate, they uh, asymmetrically, or they change their shape. How do signaling systems control and integrate into this behavior? What are the effectors of nuclear cytoplasmic effectors of these signaling pathways? Where do the forces that alter tissue architecture come from? This is still rather difficult. Genetics are not so well, uh, are not the best method to go uh, to answer questions of forces. <clears throat> so these are a few movies just to illustrate what we wanted to understand. This is how the tracheal system develops from 
individual plaque holes. As we'll see later, they're only moving, will probably run twice. So their individual tracheal cells are set aside early in development. That's the system they have to build. And if you go back in the embryo, you can see how they do it. There are about 80 cells in each of these plaque holes. They migrate to distinct places, into the head, to the dorsal side. They form individual metamers that link with each other, and eventually the whole system is connected. So these, the question is, how does that all happen? How do the cells behave? And here is another system that is quite useful to study morphogenesis in the fly embryo. This is dorsal closure, where you can see that this dorsal hole here closes during development. You can also see a lot of other things that happen. The spiracles develop here. The head involutes, as you can see here. So there are lots, lots of things that happen with regard to morphogenesis. Now, the problem with morphogenesis is that a lot of these things occur in the second to minute range. Of course, the process might be long, but cells have to do things at the cell, at the second to minute type of range. The proteins that are involved are mostly secreted or cytoplasmic. They're not nuclear proteins, so we don't deal necessarily with nuclear programming of all of these processes. Of course, they're nuclear programmed, but somebody has to do their job once these cells are tracheal cells. Mm -hmm. Drosophila doesn't make it easier in this case because the Drosophila embryo is large. It's as large as the larvae that will emerge from it and is full of proteins. So psychotic, classical psychotic genetic loss of function screens will not reveal, uh, cannot be done uh, for these proteins that are maternally provided. So it is very difficult to study uh, morphogenesis using straightforward genetic approaches. So, could we maybe manipulate directly the proteome? That might be a solution to this. So why do we actually work with genes? Of course we work with genes because we know how to do it. Nowadays we use CRISPR, you change the sequence of the endogenous gene. These methods are all established. It's ever very easy to do. And if you want to introduce a human, if you want to make your protein look like a human protein, you change the genome with CRISPR editing, and there you go. Um, why should we, in some cases, work with proteins? It's because proteins actually do the job. They are the ones that induce filopodia and uh, make cells asymmetric, the divide, and so on. But it is not so easy to remove proteins in time and space, sort of in a, uh, in a, in a given way. We can't easily do them. So we don't work with proteins because we don't have good tools. Otherwise, we would more often work with proteins. Of course, we have a lot of antibodies. They recognize proteins, so why don't we use these? Antibodies are actually, uh, could be used. So let me introduce the person who started this type of work in my lab. This is Emmanuel Cosinus. I think he lived in Paris uh, for a long time with his parents. He joined the lab when we just finished a genetic screen for novel mutations that affect uh, tracheal branching, and we didn't find a single new mutation. These were deficiency screens. A lot of mutations have been identified by us and by Krasnow's group, many other fly groups. We didn't identify a single new mutation that affected the tracheal branching uh, pattern. And, in the, and, and since, no other mutation has been identified. We don't think we know everything because we just have the tip of the iceberg, signaling molecular receptor, and then the signal goes lost in the cell somehow. <clears throat> so for Emmanuel, that wasn't really a good idea to come to a lab where a genetic screen had not revealed any new mutations. So he came up with the idea that maybe it would be better to work with proteins and to degrade or manipulate proteins. And of course, we all use antibodies. Every biological lab uses antibodies to recognize proteins, but they cannot easily be used. Antibodies are big. They cannot simply be cloned in a cell or introduced into Drosophila. But Hamers, in 1993, he discovered and described that camels have, uh, in addition to these classical antibodies, also heavy chain only antibodies. And these heavy chain only antibodies have their entire antibody recognizing region confined to about 100 amino acids. And this moiety was coined uh, uh, a nanobody by Ablings. <clears throat> now, nanobodies are very versa versatile reagents. They're about 10 times smaller than these conventional antibodies. They're about 100 amino acids. They fold, many of them fold and function intracellularly. They can be expressed as transgenes, as easily as GFP, of course. They can be functionalized, 
But of course, at that time, and even now, there was sort of no nanobody against any Drosophila protein that was either available uh, in the literature or from other labs. So the vision of Emmanuel still was that if we could grab a protein with a binder, then he could probably do with it whatever he wants to. Degrade it, put it into the proteasome, bring it into the nucleus as a cytoplasmic protein, bring it out of the nucleus so that it cannot function in the nucleus. There are many, many ways uh, you can think about to affect protein function if you could grab your protein of interest. Now, as I said, there was no nanobody against any Drosophila protein, but in, at the EMBL in Heidelberg, where Emmanuel worked, uh, he met some people who knew that Rod Power, Mildermans, and Leonard, Leonhard, they had actually a nanobody against GFP, that they, they injected GFP into camels, isolated nanobodies, several of them. They looked at the affinity, their high affinity antibodies that recognize only GFP in a fly embryo. So there was a nanobody around against GFP, and that's where Emmanuel then thought, oh, if I have a nanobody against GFP, maybe I fuse GFP first to my protein of interest, which we do anyhow in flies in order to see where our protein is. And then I could put an F box to this nanobody here, and the F box would bring this whole uh, protein complex here to the proteasome and degrade it. That was his idea. <clears throat> so he cloned these different components. He first tested it in tissue culture, and what he found that cells that were stably transfected with a histone 2B GFP construct, when they were co-transfected with this nanobody, GFP nanobody F-box fusion, the protein would be degraded. This is a nuclear protein, but still it would be degraded down to almost undetectable levels. This required the F-box plus the nanobody in a single fusion protein, so these are controls. So the system seems to work. If this nanobody F-box fusion press, uh, protein is present, it will degrade the GFP protein, uh, it will degrade H2B here because H2B is fused to GFP. He did similar studies in flies, and in flies you can make transgenes with all of this. So he, trans he made a transgene that drives the nanobody in stripes, as you can see. He made first a fly that had both a red and a green uh, histone protein, and who, when he expressed the nanobody in stripes, he, would, he could see that you can delete the green protein, and that's why the stripes now become red, because the green protein is gone, the red protein remains. This shows both the specificity, also uh, this nanobody degrades the GFP protein, but not the RFP protein. You can do the, the kinetics here. When the stripes are induced, the nanobody is be, being made, and then the GFP goes down. It takes maybe an hour, an hour and a half, until the protein is degraded. <clears throat> Emmanuel, of course, also wanted to see whether you can phenocopy now mutations. And he turned to a system that I will talk about a little bit more. This is dorsal closure. I've shown you a movie before, and the literature on dorsal closure, they have many, many people have worked on this, and the, their model is that there are different forces that drive this dorsal closure, and one of the forces uh, needs, is, comes from these amniocerosa cells and is actomyosin-driven. Uh, so the force here is actomyosin, uh, driven in, in this tissue. I'll come back to the other forces in a minute. So actomyosin is regulated at the level of phosphorylation of the, right, uh, of the regulatory light chain. This introsophila is encoded by spaghetti squash. And there was a spaghetti squash GFP uh, tagged protein and the rescue construct available from the CARIS lab. So we could generate embryos that had only one copy of squash GFP of squash, and this was a GFP fusion. The endogenous protein was gone. So the question is now, what happens if you degrade uh, this squash protein in such embryos in the omniocerosa only? This is a wild-type embryo. We've seen that before. Dorsal closure happens quite efficiently and very fast. If you do that in a squash mutant, which is rescued by squash GFP protein, and where you drive in the omniocerosa up here, you drive uh, this F-box uh, degron, or this nanobody fusion to the F-box, which degrades GFP proteins, you will see that dorsal closure doesn't occur anymore. So this shows that using protein degrons, or nanobody-driven or protein-binder-driven degrons, you can generate phenotypes that you would expect to see if you could do it genetically. Genetically, you cannot do this here. 
I'll uh, come back to this now. So clearly you can generate mutant phenotypes via protein depletion mediated by this anti-GFP antibody. So one can start to think about a lot of experiments. And one experiment we actually wanted to do is to join forces with Damian Brunner. Damian Brunner is an expert on dorsal closure, and he was the first one to show that there are pulses in these amniocerosa cells here. These are the ones that sort of become more and more narrow and disappear at the end, but pull the epidermal cells towards the dorsal side. And he actually proposed that the amniocerosa cells generate, the pulsed, generate pulsed forces uh, with apical surface oscillations, that these forces work together with a per-string actin cable generated in the leading edge. So there is an actin per-string here, right? and he published this in Cell in 2009. To confirm this model is not so easy because they are very different forces. So Damian proposed that these forces are important here, proposed also that together with this, uh, this per-string actin uh, cable here, these two forces are needed, so you contract your apical side, and as you contract, the purse string sort of makes these contractions not extend anymore, and then you sort of contract, and the, the more you go, the smaller these uh, omniocerosa cells become, and they finally integrate. Now here, for the first time, we would have methods to test this. Spaghetti squash is maternally provided, uh, so it's very difficult to do genetics. Uh, you can use drugs, but drugs will affect both tissues, so it's very difficult or close to impossible to dissect away these two uh, requirements. When you express this Degrom GFP fusion construct in a squash embryo in the omniocerosa only, you can see that the omniocerosa doesn't pulse anymore. So pulsing, this pulsing is clearly dependent on actomyosin in the omniocerosa. The purse string is still here because we didn't activate uh, the degron in these epithelial cells. So pulsing seems to be important. You can see here it, this dorsal side would never close. So what happens now if we try to dissect Damian's model predicted that both of these forces are important, the pulsing, uh, apical constriction here, and the uh, dispersed string in the epithelial cells here. So of course we can now drive this degron either in these cells or in these cells and see whether this is actually true. Do we need both of these forces? Which one is sufficient? Um, so we did that when we drive the degron in the omnius rosa cell. Here is the control. Here is the de degradation of actomyosin in, in the omnius rosa cell. Dorsal closure does not occur. And the question was, of course, what happens if we go to the epithelial cells here, which makes the purse string, does dorsal closure happen, Damian's model predicted that it should not, but clearly it does. This is the control. Maybe at the very beginning it's a bit slower, but then it proceeds at the same rate. So the take-home message from all of this is that the model proposed in 2009 with the help of these DGRAD FP novel methods, that you can now come up with a new model, which is actually the omniocerosal cell constriction, but not epidermal actin cable tension, autonomously drives dorsal closure. So protein manipulation helps to better understand morphogenetic processes. So we were, of course, quite excited that this works so well, and we have done quite a number of degradation studies, and others uh, joined in to use the Degron. Hugo Bellin used it in, in adult flies, for example, where it's also rather convenient, and genetics might be more complicated. We used it also for localization studies. We used it for activity studies. You can selectively phosphorylate a certain protein by bringing the kinase via the nanobody to GFP fused to a protein, so you selectively sort of kinase or phosphorylate the protein of interest. We did a lot of trapping studies, and very briefly I would like to show you what we did here, just to give you a second example of these protein manipulations. For many years, we and others uh, have worked on DPP, just a BFP, uh, BMP molecule, which is secreted in the wing imaginal discs in the center, and as the wing disc grows, DPP is believed to, first of all, regulate this growth, and secondly, also pattern these two compartments here, the anterior and posterior compartments, by being a localized source that generates a gradient of activity from the source to the posterior and from the source to the anterior. DPP activates PMAT, 
PMAT represses sprinkler, so it generates an anti-gradient here. And this anti-gradient, this sprinkler transcriptional re repressor also regulates target genes in different doses. So Spalt is rather narrow because it's repressed at high levels of sprinkler and on this relatively uh, uh, large. You don't have to remember any of this. The only question that we wanted to ask here is how important is it that DBP disperses? It's not so easy to predict what happens. If you have a molecule, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things at the distance. Uh, how do you make sure that this is really true? It's a model. Dispersal has been modeled nicely into such kind of data, but is it really uh, a model or is it coming close to what happens in vivo? Does the molecule actually have to disperse and make a gradient? So the only question we wanted to address here is how important is it that DPP actually disperses? Now, this is now very easy. Once you have protein binding tools, you can start to do a lot of things. So what we, almost immediately when we saw that this works quite well for degradation and that the nanobody works, we generated sort of called morphotraps. We used the same nanobody against GFP, put it onto MCD8, so it's around the plasma membrane of all cells in the wing imaginal disc, for example. And this GFP nanobody can bind to a molecule of GFP. And of course, if DPP is linked to GFP, then you will uh, immobilize DPP on the cell surface where this morphotrap is being made. So this is a control experiment. You see the DPP gradient stained with a DPP uh, uh, antibody. So extracellular staining, it makes a gradient in the posterior anterior compartment. And when you express this nanobody trap or this morphotrap here in the source cells, which are these central cells here, you can see that the gradient doesn't form anymore, neither in anterior nor in posterior compartment. You accumulate DBP in the center, but you don't make a gradient. What we could show in this first paper that DBP is required for this medial growth here, but not for the lateral growth. You can see that this still grows here, so there DBP is not required. However, we were not able to put GFP in the Drosophila genome, or we actually were able to put it in the, into the endogenous DBP locus, but these flies were not homozygous viable. So we couldn't really do very elegant studies. These studies were complicated by having DBP mutants, GFP, DBP transgenes driven by a, another binary system, and then you have to have morphotrap and the driver of morphotrap on another chromosome, so things got a little bit complicated. And Shinya Matsuda, in the, uh, guy in the lab, said maybe we can do better here, used a genome engineering platform developed in Hugo Bellen's lab to modify the DPP locus and then generated a few binders. And just briefly, I'll show you what he did. So Shinya replaced the endogenous DPP gene by various variants of DPP, DBP with a tag, so GFP DBP, HA DBP, other type of DBPs, then remove the wild type version to uh, finally come up with a, with a genome like here. This is not so easy because DBP is hoplo insufficient, so you constantly have to have a, another copy uh, if your fusion or insert is not viable. So these flies are viable. This is a fly which has HA seven or nine amino acids inserted into the DPP locus, homozygous, homozygous viable. You can now use the HA antibody to do stainings. We don't have a DPP antibody, so we can't see the endogenous gradient. Uh, but with HA, you can kind of see uh, that gradient, or here with extracellular gradient, you can see that gradient. So we have a fly now that has a tag into the endogenous locus, and we, maybe we can use more for trap now. But since we don't have GFP DBP flies, we cannot use Morphotrap. Morphotrap has an antibody that binds GFP. We would use an antibody that binds HA. So Shinya created such an antibody. He took an SCFV. I'll come back to these SCFVs. Uh, this is derived from a monoclonal antibody that binds HA. He took this heavy and light chain, fused it uh, together, and fused it to the same MCD8 transmembrane domain. So he made not a GFP trap, but the HA trap, and did just exactly the same experiment, because now he has HA tagged DPP. When he expresses, again in the source, uh, this HA trap, you can see that the HA is all trapped, all DPP is trapped. It doesn't disperse anymore to the posterior compartment. So we have a nice endogenous fly that has a tag, 
we can use a morpho trap to ask whether dispersal is important. The nice thing here is that you get adult flies because the HA DBP tag flies are homozygous viable. When we trapped DBP, so we asked, this is a wild type HA DBP uh, wing. This is a wing without DBP. DBP is required for growth. What kind of wings do we get if we don't allow DBP to disperse? We thought that these will be crappy wings, of course, because DBP is required for growth and this is required for patterning. patterning. But these are the wings we got. You wouldn't like to be an insect to fly with these wings, but you can see that the anterior compartment here looks pretty normal. Like here, you have vein two, that's the vein that DBP dispersal is supposed to control, but dispersal doesn't really seem to be important. In the posterior compartment, you also have a lot of lateral tissue left, but you clearly lack this particular domain here. This was supposed to be DBP dependent, so this seems to be true. All the rest was supposed to be DBP dependent as well, but somehow, in the absence of a gradient, you still get pretty good-looking anterior compartments, for example. So, we have a situation without DBP, no wings. We have a situation where we predict that, well, the model says the gradient makes the entire wing, but when we trap DBP in the source, what we find actually that the wing can grow to a large extent, can pattern pretty normally the anterior, the source is in the anterior here, but it cannot pass to the lateral domain. So this says that from here to here, what we have is source signaling. Here we have no source signaling, and this would result in these no wings. So source signaling of DPP seems to be a major factor of why it's important for wing growth. And you can sort of confirm this by driving DPP signaling only in the source. This is a DPP mutant. When you drive DPP uh, using genetics, through also uh, GAL4 drivers, if you drive DPP signaling only in the center by an activated receptor, for example, you can see that you get substantial growth as well. So we don't understand it all, but actually we don't understand it. We thought we would understand how DPP works, but this newer data which modifies the activity of the protein and uh, not necessarily uh, the gene here, uh, we see that things might actually be different. There might be requirements or non-requirements that we didn't really uh, think of by using uh, other studies. So we don't understand them, but we have new hints or new avenues to go using these protein binder derived tools. So before I finish, I would like to come back a little bit to this topic, why genes and proteins are from genes to proteins or from genome editing to protein manipulation. The ingredients that are used, and of course we use genome engineering to generate these ingredients. So it's not like we do things that don't rely on genetics. They rely on genetics, but the ultimate purpose is to modify the protein directly and not via the change of the gene itself. <clears throat> so what you need is kind of a target. Well, you don't need it, but if you're interested in something, that might be your target. What you need is a binder, and then you can decide on the functionalization. So I'll quickly go through these three and sort of tell you where we are. And when I say we, it's not us. It's the community that generates binders uh, and does some functionalizations. Uh, so where are we with regard to protein binders? Yeah, it's quite, actually, it's quite, quite amazing, actually, because when we started this, we didn't, beside antibodies, we didn't know about anything. We didn't know about nanobodies either, although they were published, but there are numerous binders that can be used to, gen, to do the kinds of things we do. You can use SCFVs. These are these SCFVs, heavy chain and light chain put together. These are usually only active extracellularly, so you have to twiggle them a little bit. Nanobodies, you can get them from injection into camels or llamas, or you screen large libraries. You can take tarpins. This is from Plüktun's lab in Zurich, where we did extensive screening as well. This is a cytoplasmic a scaffold that is soluble in the cytoplasm, so you don't have solubility problems like you do with SCFVs. There are repair bodies, anticalins, monobodies, afibodies. There are 50 different scaffolds. Each of them has a, a company beside which uh, Ablings was bought by Sanofi for hundreds of millions a year ago. So each of these scaffolds have companies. Each of these scaffolds can be used to isolate high affinity binders. Uh, 
usually not used in flies, but uh, used in uh, therapy. Amazingly, there are over 100,000 monoclonal antibodies. There are monoclonal antibodies against very many small tags, HA, MYC, V5, and so on. The problem with these SCFEs is that they are not so easy to make them soluble in the intracellular milieu, but methods now exist, also developed to a large extent, initially in the Plukton lab, where you take an SCFV and you graft these antigen-recognizing regions here onto a, a scaffold that is soluble in the cytoplasm, and therefore you can make intrabodies with starting from material that would not be soluble in the cell. These are now sort of methods that people can use. Alain Prochon was actually one of the first ones to use a secreted version of, of an SCFV in flies against Engrel, but this was a secreted version, so uh, solubility was not a problem. Um, there are now SCFVs against something called SUNTAC. It's a 19 amino acid GCN4 TAC, uh, the first soluble intracellularly uh, selected SCFV against the GCN4 peptide in the lab. We have tried to generate many of those as well against HA, OIOS, or against proteins. There are thousands of monoclonal antibodies available that you can clone and get a binder. So what about your target? The target is actually the, the cause of a lot of discussion in the lab. Should we, I mean, we know what we want to target. Proteins that are involved in generating forces, actin, myosin, actin binding proteins, but should we really go and generate nanobodies against all of these? Very expensive. So, <clears throat> many screening platforms do exist. You can get your binder from a company. It's not so cheap. Actually, the first company who offered the nanobody services was in, was in Paris, Hybrigenics, and Frank Perez was the one who mainly contributed to develop these libraries. So, well, you can get a binder against an endogenous protein. But what about fluorescent proteins? If you hook up a fluorescent protein to your protein of interest, you have binders. They're validated, they're high affinity. You can test them in individuals without the fluorescent antibody. So these are actually very good reagents already. And in the last two, three months, many, many binders against short tags became available. 25 years of screening nanobodies for binding to small tags has, revealed, has given nothing. These people knew that tag binders would be useful, nanobody star pins, not a single hit. But people have become smarter. They took the SCFEs that bind the small tags and made SCFEs, made SCFEs and soluble SCFEs from them. And just in the last few months, this was an older paper. This is the tag. It's about 19 amino acids called SUNTAG. It's from GCN4, but has a good binder to it that is pretty soluble, pretty good. good. These people, Tallenbaum and colleagues, developed MUNTAG. Here they took an antibody and screened for peptide binding through their target, and made libraries with peptides of the target and find some. This is a small peptide. Franken bodies were just published. This is HA tag. So that's as little as you can get. You add this to your protein of interest and you have a validated binder to it. And of course you can functionalize it. So these functionalizations, they can come in degradation, traffic relocalization, enzymatic activity, protein visualization, and I'm sure you have many other ideas of what you could do to your protein to learn more about it. So the, most, the easiest way, I mean, this was the classical way. This is when you re take real protein binders against your protein of interest. If you have a post-transcriptional modification, you have to do that. But otherwise, maybe specifically in flies, this is a better way to go because this is easy. You can use CRISPR and you have a validated binder. So Drosophila definitely is an outstanding model system to develop and use these protein binder methods. And this can be added to this new toolbox. So my last slide, 100 years of genome manipulation. You have seen where we are. It's amazing. 100 years are long, but still. A lot of things have happened. I have no idea where we'll be in 100 years with protein manipulation, but the only thing is, which is sure is that we will be much further than we would ever have thought. And with this, I'd like to thank the people in the lab, mostly also, of course, Emmanuel Cosinus, who hard started this whole uh, 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 protein-based kind of methods in the lab. Uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Marcus. That was fascinating, and uh, probably there are questions in the room. Elena. Yes, uh, beautiful talk. Uh, I was wondering how efficiently these tags and these uh, uh, nanobodies or single chain antibodies actually deplete proteins from the circulation. You know, in uh, normally, like antibodies work, they of course can deplete majority of the protein, but maybe not all. Maybe this is where the discrepancies come in the phenotype. So you, you asked in circulation. So you want to ask how well you degrade secreted proteins? A secreted pro we never degraded secreted yeah, proteins. Uh, in the other cases, I think it depends a lot on your protein target. It might be better, it might not work at all. Some proteins don't work at all. But this is also sort of only one F-box that we have used. You can use many other F-boxes. There have been Tegrons based on the same system that degrade only nuclear proteins and not cytoplasmic proteins. So this is a start, I think. Depending on your protein, you might try to use different F-boxes, but that hasn't really been done yet extensively or systematically. Yeah. <clears throat> In your wing disc, do you know if the cells send up projections to the center of the wing and if they can grab the protein that's in your membrane and use that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because, of course, when we say disperse, we don't really know what we mean. Uh, is it free diffusion? Is it uh, hindered diffusion? Is it actually no diffusion whatsoever, but extensions from uh, for cells further away come and fetch the signal? Uh, it is very clear in the DPP wing that hedgehog signaling is, is associated with uh, so-called cytonema. We did morphotrap on hedgehog. You stabilize hundreds of philopodia on the basal side. When we do that with DPP, uh, we don't see any of this. And the, deep, the cytonemes or these philopodia that were proposed to go and fetch the signal there on the apical side. We never saw on the apical side, we try to stabilize them using this morphotrap system, like for hedgehog, and we don't see them apically. What you don't see, you can't talk about, really. So I think it's relatively open how all these signalings pathway transmit the signal. Free diffusion is probably out, hormones maybe not. So I think that's still open. There's an interesting science paper two weeks ago from Tom Kornberg who says that it's all actually signaling synapses, and this is controlled by excitatory proteins that are involved in synapse uh, formation and signaling in the nervous system. Quite interesting. I take the last question. Short question short. and short answer. So, so, but then related to that, you trap it on the membrane that doesn't stop potentially vesicle recycling, right? So the CD8 can be taken in and then sent to other cells through uh, transcytosis, in theory. No? In theory, short answer. In theory, yes. <laughs> We don't see it because we tag the trap as well, so. Okay, I have questions, but uh, I'll keep it for the cocktail. So thank you very much, Marcus, again. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. <laughs>